Page of Amud Aleph, 86a. Share the page with everybody here. Fifth line. So what we're discussing is the wording in our Mishnah, which said that tshuva brings atonement immediately for life, for minor sins of various kalas. And the mission defined minor sins as both positive and negative sins. Both positive, someone who fails to do something he's supposed to do, and someone who violated a prohibition, a negative commandment. That's how we define minor sins. And we raised a couple of questions and contradictions. And at the moment, the Mishnah's understanding is, the Gemara's understanding is, I'm sorry, that when the Mishnah stated that the Shuvah atones, good morning, Alan, that the Shuvah atones for prohibitions for someone who's failed to do a prohibition, for someone who's violated prohibition for a negative commandment, it's talking about not all negative commandments, because prohibitions are much stronger than that, much harsher than that, require more in order to atone to gain atonement. Rather, it's referring to the prohibitions that are attached to positive commandments. That is to say, a person could have violated the prohibition. But there's a positive commandment that will follow. And if he follow, and if he does the positive commandment, it'll undo his prohibition. The example we gave last time is the prohibition against taking egg or taking away little chickens or birds before the mother is shooed away. That's a prohibition. So a person could have violated the prohibition, but then later redeem himself by doing the positive commandment, which is thou shalt send away the mother before you take away the before you take away the chicks. And likewise with other such commandments in which there are don't do unless you do ta 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 ta. ta. And then, so don't do, that's a prohibition, but then you can do a positive commandment, the condition, and then you'll undo. So those are the kinds of prohibitions in which Teshuva helps immediately. That's the Gemara's stance at the moment. Now the Gemara tells us as follows, Tashma, come and listen. Introducing a Mishnahic age text, it would seem. Considering the fact that the Torah says with this, at Chorev, at Mount Sinai. Chorev, Mount Sinai is called Chorev. So there it says, Teshuvah, with regard to Teshuvah, meaning after the Jews have done the golden calf, and then Moshe Rabbeinu negotiates as it were with Hashem and gets Teshuvah. And that's when Moshe Rabbeinu learned the 13 attributes of a divine mercy. Hashem Hashem Karacham Machanan Erechapayim. Right? And there, the verse reads, So there's a, there's, there's a kind of inherent contradiction right in the verse, which the Gemara is going to address now. The verse says, or a seeming contradiction, I should say, God will cleanse, that is to say, there's punishment going to come that's going to, that's going to cause, or I'm sorry, there is such a way when a God's going to atone. And then it says, but he's not going to atone. So is God going to atone for sins and not going to help us atone for sins? Which one is it? Says the the Pasuk says, with respect to Teshuva, you will get cleansed. So this would mean, it doesn't say um, any conditions as to which sins you're going to get atoned for. The Pasuk says you got to get atoned, so you got to get atoned for everything. Now, if, it's gonna, if you're going to get atoned for everything, perhaps you'll even get atoned for that sin of which the Torah itself said, lo yinaka. right? We mentioned this last week, that there's a prohibition, one of the 10 commandments where Hashem says, do not use my name in vain. And there the verse says, ki lo yinaka Hashem, because God will not atone for that. So one might think then, that when the verse later says, right, the 10 commandments come first, then the Shuvah comes later. 10 commandments come Shavuos, and the atonement comes Yom Kippur. Comes later, I'm talking about chronologically. So maybe you might think, that when the Torah says later, God says, you will be cleansed, that, that means even for that sin, which earlier he said, you're not going to get cleansed. And then for time of life, but therefore the next words in the verse is, lo yinaka, I will not cleanse. And there's the answer to the contradiction. When the verse says, benake, lo yinaka, God will cleanse, and then it says it will not cleanse. So it means like this, he's going to cleanse for everything, except remember that one thing I told you I'm not going to cleanse? Still not going to cleanse that. That's the way this, this uh, text is reading that contradiction. And if the Gemara says, it continues, 
Well, Cain, maybe you will say, okay, now when the verse says you will not atone for that sin of carrying my name in vain, which earlier I said, you know, you're not going to get atoned. Perhaps that expands to all prohibitions. That all prohibitions are just like this singular prohibition in which that no cleansing happens just from teshuva. Maybe some other things will cause a cleansing, but teshuva alone is not enough. It says the Gemara note, Tamil Daimar, this comes to teach you, es shemoi. Verse reads, lo yinake, um, the, 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 uh, sorry, the verse earlier in Ten Commandments, which says that God will not atone, it concludes, Asher ye, uh, will, not conc- will not atone, God will not atone for the one who carries his name in vain. As Shemoi, who do mean the Enamanaka. Only when your sin is that the person carries God's name in such a way, that's when there's no cleansing. Almanaka Shah but God will atone for any other prohibition that one has violated if one does the Shuvah. Now, here, this means this text clearly is of the view that even for prohibitions, so long as it's not that one singular prohibition of do not carry God's name in vain, to shiva will atone. This is unlike we've been learning last week, in which the atonement of teshuva is limited to the kinds of prohibition that are attached to positive commandments. Here, it's taking a very expansive view that all prohibitions get cleansed with teshuva immediately, with the exception of that one, that one sin of not carrying God's name in vain. So before then, sorry, in, in the, when, we, when we raised earlier texts that seemed to imply the same thing we said, when it says there that God does not atone for the sin of carrying my name in vain, it doesn't mean exclusively my name in vain, but it means all prohibitions, that all prohibitions don't get atoned right away with teshuva. That's the way we explained the other texts last week. But this text, you can't do that. Because this text, the, Gemara, the, the text clearly delineates between the prohibition of do not carry God's name in vain in which teshuva does not help, or teshuva isn't enough. Whereas every other one, every other prohibition says this text, teshuva is enough for cleansing. So it's a clear contradiction. And therefore the Gemara says, Tanoihi. Therefore we must conclude that there's actually a dispute amongst the scholars as to how far teshuva helps. Namely, does teshuva alone atone for prohibition? Or does it require some other things? Does it require Yom Kippur? Does it require a carbon? Does it require some other element in order to get atonement? Or does the shiva alone uh, uh, attain atonement for someone who is having violated a prohibition? So there's a dispute. Titania, for we have learned in Mishnahic H text, which is more clear on this subject. And then after this, we're going to quote the famous passage of Arish Mol, which becomes the halacha. And then I'll share with you the comment from the Alta Eva and Tanya. Okay, so the text reads as follows. For what does Teshuvah atone? This is this first view. Allah say, for someone who has failed to do a positive commandment. Allah say, someone who violated a prohibition. Which is attached to a, a, a positive commandment. As we explained before, there are, some, there are some prohibitions which can be redeemed by a positive commandment later, right? If the Torah says, do not do such and such unless such and such. So even if you fail to do the original thing, if you, if you fulfill the condition, you'll have undi- undid the fact that you failed to do the, pro- the negative commandment before. So that's this view, which followed the view we talked about last week. And what will Shiva suspend? Suspend meaning um, the person won't get any punishment by heaven, but the atonement is not completely done yet. And then Yom Kippur Machaber. Yom Kippur will atone. This is our crisis who misses Bezdin, the Aloysia Se Gomer. And this is someone who violated a prohibition for which one would be liable for capital punishment at the hands of the court or capital punishment at the hands of heaven or an actual prohibition. So here we see there's a clear view. So there's, there's a dispute. There's the text we quoted earlier about the verse Layanaka, which says Teshuva cleanses for all sins, including someone who violated a prohibition, with the exception of the one commandment, do not take my name in vain. Whereas this text clearly says, that the shuvah does not help for, pro, for someone who violated a prohibition, and one must wait for Yom Kippur. So here we see a dispute. Okay. I'm sorry, before we get to the text of Ishmael, we have another very famous text, which it actually actually quotes in the Chumash. So I mentioned earlier, Omar Mar, we mentioned earlier, this contradiction, this seeming contradiction in the verse, when God tells Moshe Rabbeinu, the 13 principles of, of mercy, Hashem Hashem Karacham Barachanon, and there it says, at, right at the end of it, he will atone, but he will not atone. And we asked earlier, what does that mean? Does he either atone or not atone? 
And earlier we explained that when the verse says he atones, it's a reference to all, uh, this is a reference to any sin. And, when the, and then when the verse says, I will not atone, this is a specific reference to the one sin which God said earlier I won't atone, which is someone who violated a pro, uh, the prohibition of taking God's name in vain. And now we're going to suggest another explanation. And this is the explanation that Rashi quotes in the Chumash in his commentary to explain this is a contradiction. So let's go back to what it says there. Because the Torah says by Sinai, with respect to Teshuvah, the Nake, you will be atoned. Minalon, um, like, I'm not sure what the context of the word Minalon is, but it seems like, how are we going to explain this? That's how it seems to be translated, even though it's not the usual translation. The Tanya, if we've learned, the Belezer and Belezer says, you cannot say that atonement is just blanket atonement. Because the verse says right afterwards, you won't get atoned. You cannot say the verse means blanketly, you won't get atoned. Because the verse says right earlier, you will atone. So you can't say it's definite atonement, because the verse says, I won't atone. You can't say it's definite not atonement, because the verse says, I will atone. So how Kate said, how do we reconcile this? So explains the Lezer, and this is Rashi's comment on the Chumash, Menachahulashavin, God atones for the one who returns. The Ain Menachah does not return, God atone, they shade and shove for the one who doesn't return. And that's how he explains the contradiction. So this is how Rashi explains that verse, Menachah lo Yenachah, he atones, but he will not atone. Atone for the one who returns, and doesn't atone for the one who does not return. Okay, now the statement from Rabbi Shmuel, and this remains the halacha. The quote we're about to read remains the halacha, as quoted by the Rambam, as well as right in the beginning of the Alter Rebbe's part three of Tanya, Shara Yechud, Eger Satshuva. And it seems from the context of that chapter, that's also halachic. Okay, Shara Ramasi ben Cheresh, Esa Belezer ben Azariah, the Raimi. Ramasi ben Cheresh asked, the Belezer son of Azariah in Rome, Shamata Abel Chaluk Kapara Shahid Rishmal Dairish. Have you heard of the four categories of atonement that Rabbi Shmuel would explain? So Amr Rabbi Lezer said back to Masya, it's not four actually, Shloy Shein, it's actually three. The Tshuva im Kol Echad, and Teshuva comes along with all, which, with, with each of them. This, by the way, is the clearest indication that Teshuva and Kapar are two different things. Till now it's been inferred and understood, but now it's, this is the most clear. Perhaps that's why I brought in Halacha. It's clearly, there are three types of kapara, and teshuva comes with each one. As if this is teshuva, and this kapara. So what are the three categories? Over Allah say, one who failed to do a positive commandment. Vishav, and he does teshuva. Misham, he doesn't move from that spot until he is atoned or uh, granted forgiveness. This itself, why... It doesn't say, why does it say, it's a good question, and perhaps it'll be answered when we share a few of his comment. Okay, but the bottom line is, the moment the person does the shiva, cleansed or forgiven for someone who fails to do a positive commandment. So that's category number one, positive commandment, atonement as soon as the shiva arrives. Shema, as the verse reads, shiva vonam shavavim, return, oh, my sons, oh, you captive ones, meaning to say, as soon as you return, you're here, you're cleansed, and that's all you need to do. Then, one, that's category one, failing to do a positive commandment. But category number two, over al say, one who failed to, one who violated a prohibition, then teshuva toila, toilet, teshuva is suspended, yom kippur machaper, and yom kippur does the atonement. So category one is failing to do a positive commandment, teshuva right away atonement. Category number two is someone who violated a prohibition, teshuva waits for yom kippur. Then once yom kippur comes, then atonement happens. Shnema verse reads, For on this day I shall atone for you for all of your sins. That is a verse regarding Yom Kippur. That was category number two. Category number two, three, al Christus and Mrs. Bezdin, one who violated such commandments for which one would be liable for excision by the hands of heaven or death by the hands of the court. So he didn't get death by the hands of the court because let's say the court isn't functioning or because there are certain conditions the court needs in order to, and to do capital punishment. So he didn't get the capital punishment, but he still failed at such a commandment, which is such a great and harsh sin to the point that one would be liable for capital punishment. 
So also Teshuvah, you got to do Teshuvah, that's first of all. And then Teshuvah Yom Kippur, Thailand. He also needs Teshuvah and Yom Kippur, just like anybody who failed to do a, a prohibition needs Yom Kippur. But that also is not enough. The Yisurin Nemarkin. And then suffering, pain, a person goes through in life. Nemarkin means washes him. So it's interesting language. Okay, that Dalterb explains that the word kapar also means to wash. It means l'kaneach. Shemar's the verse reads, Upakadati Peshevet Pishoim, I will remember with the rod your sins, Uvenagoyim, and with affliction, Avoinam, your sin. In other words, the verse is saying, I'm going to remember your sins with a rod, with this with harshness, with a stick. So God's saying, I'll remember, slash cleanse your sins through pain and life. Father Dalter will quote this verse as proof. Dalter will quote this verse as proof of the, the that the self-inflicting pain is not part of the shiva. Because God says, Pakadati, I will do it, not you. You, you self-inflicting pain is not going to cause atonement. Pakadati, Beshevet, I do the, Pakadati, the yud at the end means I. God says, I do the cleansing. You self-inflicting pain upon yourself is not going to do any cleansing. Why one would fast for the shiva? The Altab explains there, to show, uh, the, the fasting could be part of a prayer or part of introspection to help you do the shiva better. But the fasting itself is not the shiva, and fasting itself is not going to bring you kapara. Even though the verse says that atonement comes through pain, but that says the verse, God does, not you. Okay, so these are the three categories. And there's a fourth category. So why does he say there's only three, there's four? Well, as we'll see, the fourth category is not something you can do or something will happen in your lifetime, which is why the The first one's also Teshuvah. The first one's also Teshuvah. Yeah, okay, that's, 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 that's actually what Masha said. The problem is that Altabah doesn't quote the fourth one and he still quotes Shlesha. Right, so the Altabah doesn't know that way. The Altabah actually knows the first three is, is the three. And is, there's four categories, but the mission is introduced by saying only three. So which are the three? Is it the latter three or the first three? Sorry? There's different ways of explaining that way. The Altabah actually goes with this way. Right, so there's different ways of explaining it. Not that it goes with the first three of the three, but anyway. Okay. But, okay, like category number one is for someone who failed to do a positive commandment, to shiver right away, is cleansed. Category number two, someone who uh, uh, violates prohibition, to shiver and Yom Kippur. Category number three, someone who violates a prohibition for which one would be liable for capital punishment, in which case he needs to shiver, Yom Kippur, and then God causes him to go through pain in life, and that's his cleansing. Avo, sorry? It's only if he does the shiva first. All of this, all the things are only if he does, does the shiva first. Avo, but, someone who has a sin, such a sin, that causes the desecration of God's name, there's a public affair or some other issues, where it causes others to sin, as Rashi says. Then, ain't like koyach, but shiva, litlois. Teshuva cannot help anything suspend. And you kipper cannot atone. And, and pain in life cannot cleanse. A person has to go through all those things. He has to do teshuva. He has to have him kipper. And he might have to go through pain in life to cleanse. But still not enough. And his, the moment of death does the final cleansing. Shinemar's the first reads. And it's. it's it's been revealed to me, says the prophet. Hashem Tzavoy, God revealed to me. God, the Lord of hosts, revealed to me. Shall you be cleansed of this sin until the day you die? And that's the proof that the day of death itself brings atonement. Okay. So let's just we'll stop over here, but I just want to share with Dr. Abba's teaching. Um, because tomorrow we'll get into the details of what exactly is Chilul Hashem. What exactly does it mean that a person makes a public affair and desecrates God's name beyond just any other sin for which one violated what God wants? Okay. So there's, the Altab actually only quotes the first three categories. And the Rebbe explains the reason why he doesn't care, count the fourth is because the fourth, because Altab is concerned with um, what you have to do in your lifetime. And the last category waits for your death. So it's kind of like, what's the point of... Uh, Discussing with that. But nonetheless, the Alta still quotes there are three categories of kapara. Kapara is if to say the first three are kapara. 
Okay, but the main comment I want to share is as follows. Positive commandments to shuva cleanses right away. Violating a prohibition to shuva and then Yom Kippur, which seems to imply that a, the, violating a prohibition is worse than failing to do a positive commandment because you need more for atonement. Teshuva and Yom Kippur, whereas failing to do a positive commandment, they're just Teshuva. That's what it would seem. And I explained last week that the basic difference is that when you're failing to do a positive commandment, you haven't done anything. You just sat on your couch and didn't do something. But when you violate a prohibition, you're in, an, you're in an active rebellion mode. You actually got up to do something against that which God wants, making it in some way worse. But there's a principle in the reverse, which seems to be the opposite, which is that if a person is presented with a positive commandment, but the only way to, buy, to fulfill a positive commandment is by overriding a prohibition, then you override the prohibition. Many examples of this. Let's say tzitzis. Tzitzis is a positive commandment. Thou shalt have tzitzis, the corners of your garments. And then there's a negative commandment, not to have shotness, not to mix wool and linen. But for tzitzis, you can mix wool and linen if it, the circumstances were such that you need to do. So a positive commandment overrides a negative commandment. Now, if I look at that principle, what would I say? The positive commandment is stronger. The positive commandment pushes away the prohibition. On the other hand, when it comes to the shuva, I need more for atonement for a prohibition than for positive. So which one's greater, the prohibition or the positive? So it explains the Alter as follows. He doesn't use this muscle, but some of the commentaries in Tanya use this muscle to explain what he's saying, this parable. So imagine, right, with, with Torah and Mitzvah, we're building a home for God, right? So you're building a home. And there's an instruction manual. And the instruction manual has positive commandments. Put the wire here, put the wall there, put the door there. The instruction manual also has prohibitions. Don't break the wall, don't break the glass, right? Okay, so generally speaking, you don't want to break the glass. But what if the, pro the commandment said, make a door right there? Now in order to make the door, I have to break the glass. So obviously the positive commandment will out away because the only reason why you're not supposed to break the glass is because breaking the glass makes a mess. But over here, you're not making a mess. You're doing something positive. You're building a door. Okay, so break the glass. But when it comes to atonement, it's actually not only is a prohibition not more, actually a positive commandment is greater. Explain. What does atonement do? There's two elements here. There's teshuva and there's atonement, right? What does teshuva do? Teshuva is me saying to Hashem, I'm returning to you. Okay. But once you return to Hashem, now we have to look at the actions and say, there's a mess you made. We got to clean up. So if someone violated a prohibition, he broke the glass, not when you had to make a door. You just broke the glass. You did a prohibition. So you got to clean the glass. That fell. That's all over the floor. That's Jim Kipper. But if a person failed to do a positive commandment, what cleansing is there? There's no mess made. Now, the reason why you're forgiven right away, that's why I don't use the word cleansing, because there is no cleansing. He uses the word moichlin. He uses the word forgiven. You're forgiven right away because there's nothing else to do. So and actually, the fact that you're forgiven right away is because it's actually stricter than a prohibition. Because when it comes to cold prohibition, you made a mess. Okay, we can clean you up. But if you fail to do something, you fail to do something, no, no, nothing you can do. As the Altar quotes the famous Gemara elsewhere, which says, What are the kinds of sins that a person can ever fix? That's someone who misses the day of Shema. Because that day is never coming back. You miss Shema one morning, no, you do. You miss that day Shema. So you'll do Shuva, you'll never miss Shema for the rest of your life, and God will forgive you. But to cleanse an atonement, we can't cleanse an atonement. You didn't make a mess, and what you did, you failed, and that divine energy you were supposed to bring to that moment in time is gone. So the fact that that uh, uh, positive commandment, you get, uh, you get forgiven right away, is not because it's lighter, it's because it's heavier, actually. Because there's nothing else to do. Because the failure is so deep, Having failed that one day to bring down the divine energy was expected that day, nothing we can do. And then from Moichlin Loy, we'll forgive you. But atonement, we can't atone. There's nothing to clean. There's no mess. But you failed something. So you failed it. It's finished. It's over. It's done. There's a higher level of teshuva in which a person can go retroactively and recreate the missed moment. That's a higher level of teshuva. But a basic level of teshuva there's nothing to do. But when it comes to the prohibition, 
in addition to forgiveness, which happens right away because a person does to show with this forgiveness, there's also a kapara required. There's also a cleansing required because there's a mess we got to clean up. But yeah. So it gives this interesting insight into how prohibitions work and how positive commandments work. Positive commandment is bringing divine energy into this world. And therefore, if we fail to do it, nothing we can do about getting that back. Whereas a prohibition is about destroying God's world. And if you destroy God's world, we need to go clean it up. And that's what Jim Kippur does. Sorry? Yeah, with respect to Shuvah. Because with respect to the process of the Shuvah, it's greater. That's true. In other words, once we get to a certain point where we can't do anything more, so we go to the next. We can't do anything more. We can't recreate that day for you to say Shema now again. You're forgiven. Moichlin. But we can't clean that day. That day is gone. Except for a higher level of Shuvah, a person transcends time. That's a different level of Shuvah. Okay. God willing, tomorrow we'll get into um, what exactly qualifies as Chil Hashem as desecration of God's name. Sorry? Yeah, well, the question is, where does, where does the lava nitik lase go? In the ase category, in the lava category? Is that, is that the chilip, the chilip? He's not making the chilip, but we have to understand which category does it go into. I Meaning, one, one can make the argument that it automatically falls in the ase category, or I can make the argument that it automatically falls in the lava category. Yes, the Rambam, the Rambam quotes this lava. Yeah. Actually, it's funny. I just remember this. I want to mention this earlier. When the Altair quotes this Braisa, he doesn't quote any of the Psukim. He just says, etc., etc. The only Psukim he quotes is the last one, the second to last one, Pukadati Vishevet. Because he wants to make that point, because especially in the culture of that time, when Altair wrote Tanya, it was very uh, common that people would you know, do a sin and then they would self inflict pain for six months and then, oh, now I'm cleansed. And Altair was pushing away at that culture. Same. People used to do that. They used to, okay, we did this sin. We have to do six months of rolling in the snow or something, or six or two years of wandering, and then we'll be forgiven. And Alter was coming to say, right at the beginning, very harshly says, You guys missed the point. That's not what the show is all about. And God says, I bring the pain, not you. You don't self inflict pain. You take care of your body. You have to make sure your body's healthy so you can serve Hashem properly. Even if you didn't know what Hashem is going to do to you, you do it yourself, it's not going to help. Hashem has to do it to you. Well, they would quote certain uh, books of Muslim which say that for this sin, you need to do X amount of thing. For this sin, you need that. It's not just speculation. Al-Tab explains there that those, when these books of Muslim talk about um, like classic books of Muslim written before, like the Rekayach and Sifar Siddim, earlier books of Muslim which write that this sin requires X amount of fast, and that sin requires X amount of fast. So the Altar explains that that's someone who's after Teshuvah, yeah. after atonement. And now, in the, old, in the old days, there was something called, there was an oila, a certain carbon a person would bring that was kind of like a gift to Hashem. After having been atoned, I want to demonstrate to Hashem that I'm recommitted to this relationship. And that's where this idea of fasting comes in. It's a way of you demonstrating that I'm really committed to this relationship, but it's only after Teshuvah and after atonement that a person can do these fasts to demonstrate his reinvestment. Now that everybody actually identifies three different stages. Times the base of Mikdash, Karbon, times the temple. Times the Gemara, fasting. And there's various different stories of Chachamim who would fast after doing certain sins. And stage number three is a stage we're in, which is instead of giving Karbon and instead of fasting, give Tzedakah. Why, why is that the Messiah Tzedakah? Because the reason why the reason why the Gemara choice fasting replaced for carbon, the Gemara explains. Let the minute, the minute, I'm not eating for a day. So that the diminishment of my fat, today I'm not eating, so I'm hungry. The diminishment of my fat should be like I'm giving a carbon, which means, what's the logic? The logic is giving an animal back in the old day cost you a lot of money. You lived, you, your livelihood was, was cattle. You gave away an animal to Hashem, that demonstrates you're committed. Later in generations, Missing a day of eating demonstrates your commitment. So you have to give up something that hurts, that takes that bites. That's the point. And that's what charity is. Today, a person puts his whole life into earning a dollar. Give that away. That's going to demonstrate that you're recommitted to the relationship. Of course, Teshuvah is, up, again, this, but the, of course, learning is part of it. But the point. Yeah. 
Yeah. But here's, but again, all of this is not to Teshuvah itself. The Teshuvah itself is returning to Hashem. It says after Teshuvah, after atonement, and a person wants to demonstrate to Hashem that he's really committed, so it says the Alter Rebbe, give, give more charity than you expect. In the other context, yes, not in this context. Not in this context. In the other context, actually later in the same, in chapter 12, he gets into the importance of learning Teshuvah for the higher level of Teshuvah, actually. He connects the learning of Teshuvah to higher level of Teshuvah. It explains there at length. Okay, wonderful day, everybody.